Hey guys! After the success of my first notes video, and with questions arising about the journals by the start of the Smeraldo Books Twitter, I wanted to do videos for the tier notes and answer notes as well. If you weren't aware, these are the in-character journals from the Bangtan universe that were shipped with the Love Yourself albums. Here, I've compiled and transinterpreted multiple translations from Korean Army and put the entries in chronological order. This means that these translations aren't word for word, but translated to read fluently in English without embellishment. Because Korean is so contextual and the grammar is so different from English, it can be hard to translate smoothly. I wanted clear interpretations so the story shines more than potentially confusing grammar or context choices. That said, I'm not fluent in Korean, so if something here is wrong or misunderstands the points of the journal entries, please let me know and I'll fix it. While I transinterpreted, I want to make sure I didn't add anything or leave out anything important. For readability, I recommend you pay attention to dates and ages. Also take notes that the years seem to be following Jin's age, i.e. year 11 for Jimin means that Jimin is 8 because he's 3 years younger than Jin. I also assume these are presented in Korean age rather than an international age, so internationally Jimin in year 11 would be about 6 years old. Hope that makes sense. Now, enjoy the second installation of the Bangtan Universe story. Hoseo Kier 10, July 23rd. As I counted to four, I suddenly heard hallucinatory laughter. I watched as my childhood self, holding someone's hand, walked past me. I turned around quickly, but only my classmates were staring back at me. Hoseo? The teacher called to me. I was in math class, counting aloud the numbers of fruits drawn in my textbook. Five, six, I started counting again, but as the numbers increased, my voice shook and my hands started to sweat. I couldn't stop thinking of that moment. I couldn't remember my mother's face. I only remembered her handing me a chocolate bar as we watched the rides at the amusement park. Hoseo, cover your eyes and count to ten. But when I finished counting and uncovered my eyes, my mother was gone. I waited and waited, but she didn't come back. I counted the fruits up to nine, and my voice caught in my throat. My ears rang and my vision swam. The teacher gestured for me to continue. My friends stared at me. I couldn't remember my mother's face. If I counted to ten, my mother really wouldn't come back for me. I collapsed on the floor. Jimin, Year 11, April 6th. I walked out the entrance to the Bacolt Arboretum alone. The weather was cloudy and cool, but I felt good. I'd started my day sad. My parents had been too busy to come to picnic day but I'd been complimented during the flower drying competition and my friend's mom said I was nice. By the end of the day, I thought I was pretty cool. Jimin, wait there, I'll be right back. My teacher had told me after the picnic, but I didn't listen. I was confident I could leave on my own. I held tight to my backpack straps and walked with pride. As people watched me, I stood even taller. It wasn't long before it started raining. My friends and their mothers had already left and there was no one to look after me. My legs started to hurt. I used my backpack to cover my head and took shelter from the rain under a tree. It started to rain harder and I was completely alone. I ran out into the rain. I didn't see any houses or shops. Finally, I spotted the back entrance to the arboretum. The gate inside was open and I could see what looked like a storage room inside. Yungi, Year 16, September 19th. The fire burned bright and furious, engulfing the home I'd been raised in. The neighbors ran toward me. They were screaming. There were too many people in the streets and the fire trucks couldn't get through. I froze in my tracks. The end of summer, the beginning of autumn. The sky was clear and the air was dry. I didn't know what to think, what to feel, what to do. Suddenly, a thought. Mom! As I said it, the house collapsed with a loud crash. The house was consumed by the flames. No, the house became the flames. The roof, the pillars, the walls, my room. It all collapsed like it was made of sand. All I could do was stare. Someone pushed past me, yelling the fire trucks were almost through. Someone else grabbed me, demanding some kind of answer. They looked me in the eye and screamed, but I couldn't hear anything. Is someone in there? They demanded. Is your mom in there? They shook me by my shoulders. I answered without realizing it. No, nobody's inside. What are you talking about? A neighbor woman questioned. What about your mom? Where's your mom? No one can be in there. I didn't know what I was saying. Someone pushed past me. Side note, the original journal entry ended without punctuation. Yungi, year 19, June 17th. We had all skipped school, but there was nowhere to go. The day was hot and we didn't have any money or anything to do. Namjoon wanted to go to the sea. The younger ones seemed excited, but I couldn't care less. Do we have any money? I asked. Namjoon made everyone turn out their pockets. 
There were a few coins, a few bills, not enough for us to go to the sea. It was probably Taeyang who suggested we walk there. Namjoon pretended to consider the suggestion while the rest chattered uselessly while laughing and tumbling down the street. I didn't feel like talking, so I lagged close behind. The sun was scorching. It was midday, so not even the trees cast any shade, and the passing cars kicked up dust on the road. Let's go there! It was Taeyang. Or was it Hoseok? I didn't care enough to check which, but I knew it was one of the two. I was walking with my head down when I bumped into someone. Jimin was frozen in place, his facial muscles twitching as if he was terrified. Are you okay? I asked. But he didn't seem to hear me. His eyes were locked on a sign that read, Pukult Arboretum, 2.2 kilometers. I don't want to walk, Jungkook whined. Sweat was dripping down Jimin's pale face. He looked like he was about to collapse. What was this? It made me uneasy. Park Jimin, I called, but he didn't move. I glanced at the sign again. Hey, it's hot. Why would we go to the Arboretum? Let's go to the beach, I called to the others as if I wasn't concerned. I didn't know what the Arboretum was like, but if it was making Jimin act like this, I knew we shouldn't go. We don't have money for an Arboretum, I reminded Hoseok. That's why we should walk to the sea, Taeyang agreed with me. We could walk to the station and take a train, Namjoon suggested, but we'd have to skip dinner. Jungkook and Taeyang groaned and Sookjin laughed. Jimin started to move again when everyone else had turned toward the train station. He looked like a small child, walking with his head drooped and his shoulders tight. I turned and glanced at the Arboretum sign as we walked away. Young, Year 20, March 20th I ran down the hallway, my feet making smacking sounds against the floor. I came to a sudden stop. I could see Namjoon standing in front of our classroom. No one else knew that I called it our classroom, but it was. A room for me, my Hyungs, and Jungkook. I crept forward, planning to surprise Namjoon. Principal! I heard a desperate voice from within the classroom. It sounded like Sukjin. I froze. Was Sukjin talking to the principal? In our classroom? Why? I heard Yoongi's name, then my name. Namjoon gasped. As if he had sensed Namjoon's presence, Sukjin opened the door and his face twisted in shock. He held a phone in his hand. Namjoon stared at him, expressionless. I hid and watched. Sukjin opened his mouth to make some excuse, and Namjoon held up his hand. It's okay, he said. Sukjin looked confused. You must have had a reason. Namjoon swept past Sukjin into the classroom. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. Sukjin had told the principal everything Yungi and I had done over the last few days. Skipping school, jumping over the school fence, getting into fights. But Namjoon said it was all okay. What are you doing here? I spun around in shock to see Hoseok and Jimin. Hoseok teased me, pretending to be more surprised than I was, and wrapped an arm around my shoulders. He dragged me into our classroom. Namjoon and Sukjin were talking. They glanced at us as we reached the door. Sukjin awkwardly claimed an emergency had come up and rushed out of the classroom. I studied Namjoon as he watched Sukjin leave. He turned to us with a smile as if nothing had happened. There must be a reason Namjoon reacted like that. He knows more than me. He's smarter and more of an adult than me. And this is our classroom. I pasted my boxy smile on my face. The one everyone teased made me look like an idiot, and entered the class. I decided not to tell anyone I'd heard anything. Sukjin, Year 20, July 17th I walked out of the school and was immediately surrounded by the Song of Cicadas. The playfield was buzzing with children laughing, joking, and playing games. It was the beginning of the summer break. Everyone was excited. I walked through the crowd with my head down. I wanted to get away from school as fast as possible. Young. Shadows suddenly appeared on the ground before me and I looked up. It was Hoseok and Jimin. They looked at me with big smiles and eyes full of mischief as always. Vacation just started and you're leaving? Hoseok asked as he grabbed my arm. I muttered an affirmative, the words sounding meaningless, and glanced away. It had all been an accident. I hadn't known Jungkook and Yugi were in the storage room. The principal had accused me of covering for them. He'd threatened to tell my father I was a bad student. I had to tell him something. I told him about the hideout. I thought it would be empty. Now Yoongi was expelled and no one knew I had anything to do with it. Have a nice vacation, Hyung. I'll call you, Hoseok stated brightly as he released my arm. I didn't respond. There was nothing to say. As I reached the front gates, I remembered my first day at the school. We'd all been late and we'd all been punished. We could laugh about it because we were together. Now I'd ruined everything. Jungkook, Year 20, September 30th. John Jungkook, you're not still going there, are you? I didn't respond. I just stood still staring at my shoelaces. I was hit over the head with the attendance sheet for not responding, but I still didn't say anything. It was the classroom where I'd meet my friends, my brothers. 
I'd visited it every day since the day I'd discovered it while following them around. Not even they knew that. There were days that they didn't show up, like when they were busy or had part-time jobs. Yoongi and Sukjin would sometimes disappear for days on end, but not me. I went to the classroom every day, no matter what. There were days no one else came, but it was okay. The fact that the room existed meant that if not today, then tomorrow, or the next day, they'd eventually come. Those boys have been nothing but a bad influence on you. I was hit again. I glanced up and glared at the teacher. Another strike. I remembered Yoongi getting hit. I clenched my jaw. I didn't want to lie about not going to the classroom. Later that day, I stood in front of our classroom again. I felt like if I just opened the door, my brothers would still be there. They'd be playing and ask why I was so late. Sukjun and Namjoon would be reading. Taeyong would be gaming. Yoongi would be playing the piano, and Hoseok and Jimin would be dancing. But when I opened the door, there was only Hoseok. He was gathering the things we'd left behind. I just stood there, still gripping the doorknob. Hoseok wrapped his arm around my shoulders and led me outside. Let's go now. The classroom door shut behind our backs. That's when I realized it. Those days were gone and would never come back. Namjoon, Year 21, December 17th. The people waiting for the first bus of the day rubbed their hands together in the cold air. I held tightly to the straps of my bag and stared down at the dirt road. I tried not to look anyone in the eye. A rural town where a bus came only two times a day. I'd seen the first bus coming from far away. I followed the crowd onto the bus. I didn't look back. When someone is desperate for something they can barely hold on to, when all they can do is escape, then there are always terms. You can't turn back. If I turned back, all my hard work would come undone. Turning back was a sign of suspicion, yearning, and fear. In order to escape, I had to let everything go. The bus left. I didn't have any plans. There wasn't anything I was yearning for, or a reason I had to leave quickly. I was blindly running away from my mother's tired face, my troubled sibling, my father's illness. From the home that demanded sacrifice and peace while the family situation grew worse and everyone pretended not to see it. But most of all, I was running from poverty. If you asked if poverty was a crime, everyone would say no. But is it? Poverty wears everything away. Precious things become meaningless. You end up giving up on the things you thought you could never give up. It can make you suspicious, scared, and resigned. In a couple hours, the bus would reach a familiar stop. I hadn't said any goodbyes when I'd left a year ago, and now, without any notice, I was returning. I tried to remember my friends' faces. I had lost contact with all of them. Would they be happy to see me? Would we be able to smile together again like the old times? The windows fogged in the cold until I couldn't see through them. I traced my fingers over the glass. You need to survive. Sukjin, year 22, April 11th. The car screeched to a stop. I'd been so lost in thought I hadn't seen the light turn red. Students in familiar uniforms stared at me as they used the crosswalk. People pointed at me. I gave a strained smile and bowed. I knew what I had to do, but that didn't mean I wasn't scared. Would I ever be able to end all this misfortune and pain? Was failing over and over again a sign that I'd never succeed? Should I give up? Was our happiness really false hope? My mind spun with all my thoughts. I reached the intersection near the gas station and spotted Namjoon working. I drew a deep breath and exhaled slowly. Yoongi, Husuk, Jimin, Taeyong, and Jungkook's faces drifted through my mind. I changed lanes and headed to the gas station. I couldn't give up. Even if there was just a 1% chance of success, I had to keep trying. Through my window, I saw Namjoon approaching. Jungkook, Year 22, May 2nd. When I looked up, I was in front of Namjoon's shipping crate hideout. I opened the door and entered, collecting all the clothes scattered across the floor to be a blanket. I huddled there, trying to sleep. A chill set in. My whole body trembled, and I felt like I wanted to cry, but I couldn't even do that. When I woke up, Yoongi was standing on top of a bed. The edges of the sheets were on fire. I was consumed with anger and fear. I wasn't good at talking. I'd never been good at expressing myself or persuading other people. I cried so hard I started to cough, making it harder to speak. The only thing I was able to say while running into the fire after Yoongi was, We promised we'd all go to the sea together. What's wrong? Did you have a nightmare? I opened my eyes as someone shook my shoulders, waking me. It was Namjoon. I felt a wave of relief. He felt my forehead and said I had a fever. I certainly felt like I did. The inside of my mouth was boiling, but everything else was cold. I had a splitting headache and my throat hurt. I could barely get down the medicine Namjoon gave me. Sleep more. We'll talk later. I nodded my head. Can I be an adult like you someday? 
Namjoon turned away from me. Jimin, year 22, May 19th. In the end, I knew I had to go to the Arboretum. I had to stop lying, telling everyone that I didn't remember what had happened there. Hiding in the hospital, having seizures. I had to put a stop to it all. I had to go back. With that in mind, I'd come to the bus station every day for a long time, but I could never actually get on the bus. I had already watched three buses pass when Yoongi sat next to me. I asked why he'd come, and he said he was bored and had nothing to do. He wanted to know why I was sitting at the station. I bowed my head and kicked at the ground with the tip of my shoe. Why was I sitting there? Because I was a coward. I wanted to pretend I was okay. I wanted to pretend I knew something. I wanted to pretend I could get over it, but in reality, I was afraid. What would I face at the Arboretum? Would I be able to endure it? What if I had another seizure? I was scared. Yoongi just sat there calmly as if he wasn't in any rush to do anything. He made useless small talk and said the weather was nice. I hadn't noticed the weather until he mentioned it. I'd been too anxious to notice anything about my surroundings. The sky was blue and there was a warm breeze. The bus to the Arboretum approached. It stopped and the door opened. The driver glanced at me. Without thinking, I asked, Kyung, can you come with me? Hoseok, year 22, May 20th. Taeyang and I left the police station. You did well, I told him, my head bowed. I was trying to sound more spirited than I really felt. It wasn't a long walk from the police station back to Taeyang's house. If he lived further away, would he be taken in by the police less often? Why had his parents chosen to live so close to the cops? Taeyang was so nice it was almost stupid. The world had been unfair to such a gentle kid. I wrapped my arm around his shoulders. Are you hungry? I asked as if nothing had happened. He shook his head. Did the police give you anything to eat? Taeyang didn't answer. We walked together in the sunshine, but a cold wind blew in my heart. If I felt this way, how was he feeling? How many times had his heart been broken? Could he even have a heart left? How much was he holding in? I couldn't look him in the eye, so instead I watched the sky. An airplane passed overhead. The first time I'd seen the scars on Taeyang's back was when we had been hanging out in Namjoon's storage crate hideout. I couldn't say anything then. His smile had been so sweet and innocent when he'd been given Namjoon's t-shirt, but my heart had shattered. I didn't have any parents. I had no memories of my father and only faint memories of my mother, who had left when I was seven. I'd had my fair share of pain at the hands of my family. People say you have to get over it. You have to accept the past and let go. You have to forgive them and move on. But some things can't be done just by trying hard enough. It wasn't that I didn't want to forgive them. It wasn't that I hated them. It was just that no one had ever taught me how to move on. I was scarred before I even knew how to navigate the world. I know everyone has scars, but why did we have such deep wounds? Why was this much pain necessary? Why did our lives have to be like this? Kyung, it's okay, I can go alone, Taeyang said as we reached the crossroads. I know, kid, I answered and continued walking him home. It's really okay. See, I'm fine. Taeyang smiled. I didn't say anything. He wasn't fine. He couldn't be fine. He just knew that if he ever admitted it, he wouldn't be able to keep going. He had to ignore it for so long that it had become habit. Taeyang flipped up the hood of his sweater and followed me. You're really not hungry? I asked as we reached the side street leading to his house. He gave me a foolish smile and nodded. I watched him walk the last few steps home. The path he walked was narrow and desolate. So was mine. We were both alone. I turned around to walk away, and my phone rang. Young, year 22, May 20th. I looked down at my hands. There was blood on them. My legs suddenly lost their strength. I was going to collapse, but someone hugged me from behind. Misty sunlight streamed through the windows. My older sister was crying, and Hosuk stood there silently. Dirty household items and blankets were scattered everywhere like always. There was only empty space where my father had once stood. I didn't remember when or how he ran away. My heart was still filled with the uncontrollable rage and sadness I'd felt when I'd charged at my father. I don't know what had kept me from stabbing him. I didn't even know how to calm down. I hadn't wanted to kill my father. I'd wanted to kill myself. If I could bring myself to it, I would kill myself right now. I couldn't cry, but I wanted to cry. I wanted to scream, kick, and break everything, destroy everything, but I couldn't do anything. Kyung, I'm sorry. I'm okay. You can go. Somehow my voice came out dry even as I was losing my mind. I didn't sound like myself. I forced Hosek away even though he didn't want to leave. I looked down at my hands. Blood was seeping through the white bandages. 
Instead of stabbing my father, I had hit the bottle on the floor, shattering it and cutting open my palm. I closed my eyes and the world spun. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to survive. As I returned to my senses, I was looking down at Namjoon's number on my phone. Even in such a situation, no, even more so because of this situation, I was desperate for his presence. I wanted to tell him, Hyung, I, my father, the one who created me, the one who beat me daily. I was about to kill him. Seriously, I was about to kill him. No, I did kill him. I killed him over and over again in my heart. I wanted to kill him. I want to die. Hyung, I don't know what to do. I just want to see you. Namjoon, year 22, May 22nd. We have a one year age difference. No, I didn't say that. I'm older, I know, but he's old enough to take care of himself now. Okay, I get it. No, I'm not mad. I'm sorry. I hung up and stared down at the ground. Lukewarm air blew in off the ocean and swept through the pine trees. I was so angry I felt like my heart was going to burst. On the ground, ants traveled in a straight line through the half-sand, half-dirt soil. If a giant was looking down at me, could they see where I was going? Why I was going there? Could they see where my path would end? It's not that I didn't love my parents. It's not that I wasn't worried about my younger sibling. I would have ignored them if I could, but that wasn't who I was. If I couldn't leave them behind, what was the point of all my struggling? What was the point of getting angry and wanting to escape? In the distance, I could see someone's back, someone standing as stiffly as I was. It was Jungkook. He had once told me, I want to be an adult like you. I hadn't been able to respond. I wanted to say that I wasn't that great, that I wasn't even an adult yet, but that seemed too cruel at the time. The kid already didn't get the love and attention he needed. I couldn't tell him that getting older, growing taller, and living more didn't make anyone a real adult. I wanted Jungkook's future to be kinder than mine, but I couldn't promise that I would be helpful in getting him there. I walked up to him and wrapped my arms around his shoulders. Jungkook raised his eyes and looked at me. Yoongi, year 22, June 15th. I could only hear the music banging around inside my head. Where was I? How much had I had to drink? What was I doing? I didn't know or care. It wasn't important. It was night when I staggered outside. I crashed into pedestrians, newsstands, walls. It didn't matter. I just wanted to forget everything. Jimin's voice rang in my ears. Hyung, Jungkook. The next memory was running up the hospital stairs. The hallway was too long, too dark. Patients in hospital gowns walked past. My heart was racing. Their faces were too pale and completely expressionless. It was like they were all dead. The sound of my own ragged breathing echoing in my mind disturbed me. A hospital door had been left ajar, and I could see Jungkook lying inside. I subconsciously turned away. I couldn't look at him. I heard a piano, a fire, a building collapsing. I held my head in my hands and slid to the floor. It was because of me. If only I didn't exist. My mother's voice. No. My voice. No. Someone's voice. This was why I had to suffer. I didn't want to think it was true, but Jungkook was lying there, surrounded by soulless patients wandering by. I couldn't go in his room. I couldn't check if he was okay. My legs were shaking as I stood and ran away. Tears formed in my eyes as I fled. Funny. I couldn't remember the last time I cried. As I stumbled toward the crosswalk, someone grabbed my arm and I spun around. Who was it? No, it didn't matter. It was always the same. Don't come near me. Go. Please, just leave me alone. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to get hurt. So please don't come any closer. Jimin, year 22, July 4th. When I came to my senses, I was washing my hands in the sink until my skin started to peel. My hands were shaking and my breathing was unsteady. Blood was running down my arm. My eyes reflected in the mirror were bloodshot. My memories returned in fragmented pieces. I'd been momentarily distracted. I'd been doing a partner dance with an older girl in my dance club, but I stepped wrong and we bumped into each other. I'd hit the ground and skinned my arm. On impact, all my memories of what happened at the Arboretum when I was a child came back. I'd thought I'd gotten over it, but I was wrong. I was in a panic. I needed to be clean. I needed to hide. I was an eight-year-old boy, still running away in the rain. Hosek, year 22, July 4th. I stepped out into the hallway while the doctors were giving her emergency aid. Even at night, the hospital was full of people. I was dripping with rain and sweat. 
As I was shaking the water from my hair, I dropped her bag. Miscellaneous items fell out. Coins, pens, and towels rolled and scattered across the floor. In the middle of the mess was an airline ticket. I scanned it, and I picked up the rest of her things. That was when the doctor called me. He told me there was nothing to worry about. She just had a mild concussion. After a moment, she walked out. Are you okay? I asked. She told me her head hurt a little and asked if I would carry her bag. She noticed the airline ticket peeking out of the bag and glanced at my face. I shifted her bag to my opposite shoulder as if nothing had happened and led her outside. The rain continued to fall as we reached the exit. We stood side by side in the doorway. How sick, she called to me as if she wanted to tell me something. Wait here, I'll buy an umbrella. I ran into the rain toward the convenience store across the street before she could say anything. I knew that she'd recently auditioned for an international dance team. If she had a plane ticket, she must have been accepted. I didn't want to hear her tell me she was leaving. I didn't know if I'd be able to congratulate her. Namjoon, year 22, July 13th. I leaned my head against the bus window. From the library to the gas station, it was the same trip every day. The same streets and the same boring scenery sped past outside. Would I ever get away from these same landscapes? It felt impossible to think of tomorrow or have any hope for something else. A girl with her hair tied back with a yellow rubber band sat ahead of me. She sighed, her shoulders rising and falling, and she leaned her head against her window. For about a month now, we'd studied at the same library and taken the same bus. We never talked to each other, but we constantly saw the same repeating scenery. We lived in the same space. We sighed the same sigh. I still carried a hair tie in my pocket. The girl always got off three stops before me. Every time I watched her go, I'd wonder if she was going to hand out flyers again. What was her day going to be like? What did she have to endure? How often did she feel that tomorrow would never come? That perhaps tomorrow didn't even exist? How often did she feel like I did? Her stop was getting closer. Someone pressed the stop button and people stood. She didn't move. I stayed still with my head against the window. She looked like she'd fallen asleep. Should I wake her up? I didn't know what to do. We reached the stop and the girl still didn't move. The people exited, the doors closed, and the bus took off again. After three stops, she still hadn't moved. I stood to exit and hesitated again. Once I left, no one else would take care of her. She'd wake up far away from where she wanted to be and her day would be even more exhausting. I left the bus and headed for the gas station. The bus took off again and I didn't look back. I'd left the hair tie on her backpack but didn't do anything else. The moment hadn't been the beginning or end of anything. There was no connection between us to begin with, and there was never any reason for there to be. So I guess none of it mattered anyway. Taeyang, year 22, July 17th. My side hurt like it was going to split open. My sweat dripped as I ran. The railroad tracks behind the convenience store, underneath the overpass. The kid was nowhere to be found. I ran all the way to the bus stop, but I still didn't find her. The people waiting for the bus stared at me as if I were crazy. What happened? We hadn't made any plans to meet, but it was still strange. The kid always just turned up somewhere and followed me around. Even if I told her she was annoying, she never listened. But the kid wasn't in any of our normal hangouts. I paused next to a familiar wall. We'd graffitied here together. It was the first bit of art the kid had ever finished. Now there was a big X over her piece. She'd done it. I didn't know how I knew, but I did. Memories like images seemed to superimpose over the wall. The way she'd laughed at me the day I bumped my head while trying to lie on the railroad. The way she helped me up after I fell while helping her run away. Her expression when she'd gotten mad at me for eating her bread. The way her face fell when we passed a family portrait studio. The way her eyes would trail after passing students. As we'd graffitied the wall, I told her, if you're having a hard time, tell me. Don't suffer alone. Now her ex was drawn over all our memories, as if saying they'd all been fake, like they'd all been lies. I subconsciously curled my hands into fists. Why? There would never be any answers. I turned and walked away. I was alone again. Both of us were. Jungkook, year 22, July 26. I picked wildflowers in the hospital garden bed. I had to keep my head bowed to hide my smile. The sunlight was warm and bright. I knocked on the hospital room door, but there was no response. I knocked again and opened the door. The room was dark and unusually cold. There was no one there, only quiet darkness. I left the room. I'd met her when I was feeling suffocated and angry, speeding down the hallway in my wheelchair. She'd appeared suddenly. I was barely able to stop in front of the girl with her hair in a ponytail. 
Outside the hospital was the bench where we had listened to our songs together while drawing. I remembered sitting on the roof together, drinking strawberry milk. I still held the wildflowers, but now I had no one to give them to. Suk Jin, year 22, August 30th. No one can remember when love begins, and no one can predict when love will end. Why can't humans ever perceive these moments? And why was I given the power to restore everything to the way it was? The car slammed on its brakes, its headlights flashing as she was thrown into the air before she hit the ground. I froze. I couldn't hear or feel anything. Even though it was summer, the wind felt cold. There was the sound of something rolling down the road, then the smell of flowers. I started to come back to reality. The bouquet of smeraldo flowers dropped from my hands. She was lying in the middle of the street. Blood seeped through her hair, the dark red puddle running down the road. If only I could turn back time. So what does this all mean? Well, I'm not going to make any big predictions until I've done all the notes and compiled everything into chronological order, but I think we have a pretty solid timeline right now linking up to the highlight reels. It's important to note that all the girls from the highlight reels are now accounted for except for Yoongi's girl. This is important because we've now had a scene from the reels that featured her, but here in the journal she's just a random stranger grabbing for Yoongi when he's drunk. Her presence still feels like some kind of symbolism for Yoongi's relationship to Jungkook, but again, I can't make any decisions until I've gone through all the evidence. So where will the story go from here? To be honest, I'm surprised they've given us so much information. The stories even tie oddly well into the Wings solo songs, though admittedly, I think this was intentional and decided after Wings was released. Still, it's hard to listen to Lai and not think of what Jimin's character went through as a child, or not to think of Yoongi's relationship to the piano in his song when his character associates the piano with his mother's death. It's worth having another listen to each of them. And if Smeraldo Books drops novels that solve this whole story, it's been nice theorizing with you. But until then, I'll keep trying to piece this together and provide elements that can help someone else put it together. This has been a fun game to play with all of you. I love all of the different stories we've been able to create together and as individuals. So until next time, live long and prosper. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, hit the notification bell if you want to see when more theory videos are released. Bye!